Okay, welcome back. Uh, delightful glitch uh, required me to have to um, bring from the surface back up to this position. Uh, the glitch was um, manifold. Uh, one was no uh, gimbling of the descent engine on this guy right here. And the other glitch was that the particle effect for the you know, super smoke screen for the descent engine just disappeared magically from there. And I did a little research and tried to figure out if there was a way to bring it back, uh, you know, adding it to the save file or refreshing or reverting of any kind, but no go. So I just had to launch again from the surface. So uh, here we are um, approaching the moon. So I'm going to use um, the always very useful MechJeb Maneuver Planner to plot a change of, um, let's see, change my apoapsis at the next peri. So I want uh, to match, or actually I think I could just use circularize, right? Circularize at the next periapsis. Um, so that's close enough, create node. So it tells me how much delta V I'm gonna burn, when it should be and all that. Nice, uh, lovely node I could automate or not, my, my choice. All right, so I want to control from here now um, because these are the engines I want to use. So to get the nav ball pointed in the right direction, that's what I got to do. And I will, ah, right, I have CLS because it comes with realism overhaul, but there is a node right here, this part, uh, is between the two. Oh, maybe I can, let me see if I can learn something. Hatch status closed, um, deploy, disable. Hmm. So it says hatch status closed, but I don't see an option to open that hatch, so clearly some CLS needs to be set up. I'm really not from too familiar with the, you know, the uh, module manager code to add that uh, functionality for realism overhaul. So what I always just do is um, just allow crew to pass because um, as I work out, you know, the, the various um, issues and glitches in these mods, you know, as I uh, help to build up realism overhaul configs for them using um, module manager, you kind of run into more and more granular issues, so like that. You know, it's not a huge critical issue. I can get around it just by EVAing over or just disabling that feature in CLS. But you know, there's always polish to be added to any given mod. There's always something that can be done to improve it. Hmm. Well, not necessarily to improve the mod. I mean, just to improve its compatibility with all the mods that are included and supported by Realism Overhaul, which is a lot. All right, so I'm just going to get myself in position for that burn. And then I'm going to transfer some crew over into this craft because one of my theories for why it uh, didn't, uh, why this engine wouldn't gimbal nicely was that, let's see, let me just use a little bit of cheating to stop that rotation. <laughs> All right, so let me transfer some guys over. Um, Valentine is the pilot, so bring her over. Okay. And let's see. Well, no burn to be done now, but I've transferred the crew over. And time to execute next node. So let's give it RCS and tell it to execute. Let's see if that works. So these engines are active. I think I, I activated them through staging. Ooh, no, that's the bottom tank I've got collected. Yep. So they're active there. So just get them into... Once it moves into position, so 20 hours from now, we will have moved to our closest approach of the moon. Uh, yes, and so because I was in time warp, this had previously, so in my kind of getting here again, um, my um, translunar stage, the exploration upper stage, um, had actually I had actually got it onto a collision course with the moon, so like the later Apollo missions, but because we were in time warp when it passed between the spheres of influence, you know, fun math uh, errors during high warp caused it to no longer be uh, hitting the, the moon. And I wonder if that's something that could be added by a mod or in stock where it doesn't make those issues where the game is aware that other you know, non-focused um, craft are going to be passing through sphere of influence changes so it could um, keep those correct as well. But who knows. Thankfully here it was just a spent stage and not something critical. Okay, so um, hmm, where am I? Doesn't I feel like I'm not seeing the sun. See, that's, that's another reason I don't necessarily like to use this ambient light tool. Oh, or it's making little corrections. Hmm. So I expect it to make, uh, is because uh, usually I can tell by how bright it is whether I'm in sunlight. And it looks like I'm not. It looks like I'm on the nighttime side. Oh, there we go. Lit up the engines. All right. So 
So if I disable the RCS, um, I don't think I'm seeing these gimbal. Now you, you'll be able to tell if the craft starts to veer off of being pointed right that way. So that was an issue I had before and I still, I know these have gimbal so I can see the gimbal limit here and I've looked in the code because I set the gimbal for these parts to five degrees. Um, so it should be able to hold this position with that five degree gimbal. So that's part of how I can tell that it's gimbling, but I or should that it um, whether it's gimbling uh, appropriately or not. Uh, maybe it's that as well. Let's see. Oh, I think I'm seeing the move. Yes, indeed. All right, good. So thankfully, those engines are gimbling. Now I'm not sure what trick allowed that to, to work as desired. Um, it might be that I moved the crew over. I'm really not sure. Um, hmm. Don't know if I'm safe to move the third crew member over while I'm at high warp, or well, sorry, not at warp, while I'm under acceleration or not. So this is the way that the actual, the kind of the mission design for Orion with an Altair would have functioned. Um, rather than the service module here, like in Apollo, service module is a really big guy, and that's because it has enough fuel to do this, uh, you know, fairly substantial braking maneuver to put this whole assembly into lunar orbit. Um, here, the clever idea is to include that in so it's sort of a, not quite. It's not a crasher stage, but it is a stage that we don't have to carry the empty tanks for this um, back to Earth. So once the tanks for this have been emptied, they're just left on the surface of the moon. I find it it's a rather clever idea, um, which I may have already discussed, but it's quite useful that this stage is built heavily uh, and you know. It has enough control and everything that it could um, break just a payload into lunar orbit without bringing the Orion and, and men here at all. Um, I think the kind of Apollo um, Apollo applications program plans were that if they wanted to send cargo to the moon, they would still have to bring the service module with the you know with nominally with a crew uh, in order to break the the LEM or you know, LEM derivative with cargo into lunar orbit. But here. Um, the descent stage of the Altair is entirely capable of doing that itself. So in theory, you could have used um, Ares V, Ares V vehicles to send lunar payload, um, the Altair derivatives, to the moon and landed them. So I definitely like that design. Um, the, now the reason I use the term crasher is the N1, the Russian um, space program's plan to land uh, men on the moon, had a stage uh, similar to that, it would uh, break the whole craft into lunar orbit, and then that portion would also stay attached to their manned lander, and you know it would run out of fuel. It was intended to run out of fuel right bef above the lunar surface, and then the the descent stage, the lower you know legged part of their LK uh, lunar lander, just had a little bit of fuel to finish off that landing, and so that allowed their lander to be even lighter. Um, you know, than the LEM design. Of course, it only carried one man. That was the, the plan for the LK. So this is another, you know, relatively long burn because we've only got a G-force of 0.1, but we're, you know, in the influence of the moon, so you don't need nearly as much G-force to, to get done what you need to get done. In fact, here, in, you know, due to the, um, the moon's lower gravity, um, even with 0.1 Gs of you know, Earth acceleration, we have um, thrust weight ratio on the moon of, of 0.64 and, and that's you know, once we're no longer that that will give us enough uh, thrust weight ratio once everything is said and done to safely descend to the surface so let's see let's put the gear out so the gear is built into this stage and it's configurable um, you know I could have changed it to like these are basically the same part like see they've got the same name and so in the VAB you know, the vehicle assembly building, I s selected that this one should have legs. It should be the 4.9 meter hollow, so that's why it's, you know, hollow core. And this one is different, is, oh, it's actually 4.9, hmm, not sure what has the same name. I think, I thought that should be different, the tank type, uh, because you can clearly see these are made of, composed of smaller tanks that aren't as deep, and those are heavier tanks that are, that are deeper. So you can see it carries more fuel. I'm not sure why the name isn't different, but whatever. And I also set it to have um, solar panels that I'll use when I'm down on the surface, rather than the legs like this one has. And they both have ladder portions. So this is just a flat ladder, as it says here, external option ladder. And this one is an extending ladder, which can extend all the way down to the surface. So it's a really, really slick lander set, um, uh, Shadow Mage of this mod, SSTU, um, created it that way. 
and I really like it. It's really slick. I kind of gave up on playing stock oh so long ago when I just couldn't for the life of me. I had to spend so much time uh, in my you know, design mission planning to get ladders so that I could climb down onto the surface of lathe. And even after a bit of that planning and even testing and landing it on Earth's surface, I, you know, there's kind of a transition between a couple of ladders where um, my little Kerbal could not get over the edge, despite the fact that everything else about the mission plan was successful, really took me, you know, not that much time. Um, just how broken ladders are just made me rage quit a little bit of the stock play. Uh, because I, you know, I, I like these heavier missions, right? I want a reason to build heavier uh, payloads, heavier rockets, and that was to be able to send people or Kerbals to the various planets. And, well, if, if ladders are going to cost me hours and hours of play to get them to work, it's just it's not worth it. And so I went to the challenge of realism overhaul, the RSS. Uh, and only recently have I started kind of playing in stockish stuff again. Partially because of this, because it's so easy um, with these this ladder design to send somebody down to the surface without having to worry about you know testing and all this craziness of, of ladder design. So anyway, uh, now that I've got that spiel off, let's see. So we're still breaking into orbit. Another few more minutes. So what remains to be done? done with these guys. I still need to transfer the crew member. So I'm just um, going time warp. See, so yeah, I've just recently I added the effects to these engines because um, they didn't have smokescreen effects yet, or at least when I was playing with them. And so now they, they do. Uh, obviously in time warp you can't see them. Here we go, they come back. Uh, because it's a hypergolic fuel, so these, you know, these are fuels uh, the fuels that are used in these stages are uh, similar to the fuel used in, well, actually, are they the same? Yep, NTO and MMH, you know, um, some chemical shorthands, I won't go into those now, but they're chemicals that, um, unlike, say, kerosene and liquid oxygen or hydrogen and oxygen, they don't need a spark to get the engine running. The two chemicals, they're designed such that they, you know, will um, combust simply when they come into physical contact with each other. Uh, so the shuttle orbital um, maneuvering system uses that type of fuel, um, you know, as did service module for Apollo, the first and second stage for the Titan, which launched the Gemini. And so that's why in the smoke screen here you can see that I used the templates that are called hypergolic OMS uh, white, because I figured, you know, they look, they look for pretty decent. Um, and just by scaling them, putting them in the right place, uh, due to the great template system of, of uh, smoke screen and real plume, just able, uh, able fairly easily to add those to this. So let me just complete the breaking of the stage. So if you were paying attention, I didn't notice, but see, um, one thing I notice is, is lacking in some Kerbal uh, YouTube videos is just the numbers. I don't know, I'm a personal fan of the numbers, right? That's what kind of captures some part, good part of my brain. And so if you notice how much mass, how much fraction or how many tons of fuel we're burning just to get into lunar orbit. It's quite a substantial amount of the payload. Uh, if I remember, what was it, 60, 65, 66, something like that tons uh, was what we, uh, what this total craft massed when we uh, completed the TLI burn and transposition and docking. There we go. So now we've been, where we captured in lunar orbit. The orbit is, see, it's just still above 70 kilometers, which is kind of my goal. And now we're bringing down the, the apoapsis. We want to kind of circularize it. As I did there, and it won't be a you know, won't be a perfect circularization because this burn time took so long. Um, you have to do a bit, quite a bit more complex math to extrapolate for such a long burn versus an instantaneous burn. Because short burns are close to an instant burn, so the math works pretty well. But a really long burn like this it just takes a lot more. I'm disappointed that it doesn't show those effects. I'm gonna have to tweak them again so that when you're at high time warp, or well, you know, high physical time warp, is that what it's called here? you don't get to see the effect. Only at three do you just see the last remnants of it. Mm. I think that has something to do with particle lifetime. Because the particles are generated and they evolve through a couple of different states and then after a certain number of ticks, they disappear. So maybe these particles aren't being allowed to live long enough so that they're showing um, when I'm at 4x. So nearly completed. So you see the tank. You were draining quite a bit of the descent engine tank just for this. That's why the the lower stage, the descent stage of the of the Altair is so over, yeah, so big. If you ever see pictures of it, I recommend you look. They do, it doesn't look exactly like this, of course. But there's a few different design looks that you know, 
they were kind of similar. It's just composed of a whole bunch of big tankage and this light structure. Sometimes there's kind of sheeting over it. Um, that's why the descent stage is so large, is because it has to do the job that in Apollo the service module had to do. So at this point we will be we will have safely braked um, relatively close to the you know to the equator of the moon or whatever it would be called for the moon, a relatively low inclination. Which was my goal. Oh, oh da, da, da. slow down back to normal time. So only a couple more meters per second needs to be delivered. See the thrust to weight ratio has increased quite a bit because We've burned off so much mass in this maneuver, and I'm really glad that the gimbling is working now. I think that'll be most, pretty much all I do for this video. Some of these burns are just so long that if you're trying to do, you know, uh, a short to medium length video, that most of what it is, is is the burn, even at time warp. I think that's one aspect people may not like about realism overhaul or, or you know, the real solar system is that in reality, these burns do take a long time. And that does influence my mission design as well, like personally sometimes. I, I like the higher thrust weight stages, even though they may be a little less efficient, um, you know, or somewhat less efficient, simply because it saves more of my time. If I, you know, if I can get it done in a three minute burn instead of a 30 minute burn, that's probably how I'm going to design it. There we go. And we have, uh, so just looking at the orbital numbers here, we are, wow, really close to circular. Mechjeb, um, as pretty much always does a really good job. So we've got into our desired orbit uh, with you know, not burning any fuel out of this service module. So it's all it will have to do is when everything's said and done, we've transferred all, oh, that's a good thing. I want to transfer, so the rest of the crew transfer over. Come on, select a module, didn't work, why not? Uh, transfer you over. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll have to do that in the next video. Or, you know what, I'll just do it in EVA. Because I like to do the little EVA, it's a bit of a strange challenge. Alright, so he rightens himself up so I can see the little door there. You can see how big these kind of human scale craft are compared to the little kerbals. I don't know how you'd fit uh, three or four people into this, but, you know, Suppose you find a way. They only have to stay in there for a week or less, and they get to do EVAs. And I suppose that's just how it is. That's the price of spending a week on the moon with uh, three of your best trained buddies. Come on. Down to the surface. Again, why I wouldn't mind playing this game with 3D tools. There we go. Board. And, oh, grab. And board. There we go. All right, so we have all the crew in here now, because, you know, with modern technology, this can just loiter in low lunar orbit uh, with no people aboard. Uh, so next video, we will be uh, decoupling, and uh, the Altair, with its current crew of, you know, these three, will head down to the surface. Um, I think that'll be the, the most fun, you know, video in the series. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.